Hello, everybody. Hello, and welcome to Fridays at Five. I'm Karen Taylor here with The Normal Suspects. But if you're watching a recorded version, we'd love to have you live sometime. And I'll just say that. We've got a wild crowd here in the room. And then we've got all these people that talk about us later about how they watch our shows. So we're glad to have you. Um, today's topic brings a lot of uh, special guests into the room. Uh, the topic is Color It Out. And this is our, our uh, foundation game, I would say, for the color vowel approach and the color vowel system. And so today's topic is five ways to use color it out. And I expect we will find more than five ways because uh, we see a lot of creative people in the room. I'd like to start off by introducing Laura White McIndoo, who is the creator of Color It Out. Hi, Laura. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Good to see you. Um, it's been now, I think, seven years since you created this game. Is that about right? I think six, maybe. Yeah, yeah maybe six, maybe 2014, right? Yeah, it, and so in just right. six short years, um, this game has gone from where to where? Could you start off with the origin story so we can enjoy that sure. for a moment? So I created Color It Out um, just you know, over a weekend. I was thinking about how to really play with um, color vowels. And I always love taking a regular um, game that people already know and adapting it for language learning, you know, like a board game or something. And um, the idea came into my head to adapt um, Uno basically and matching words and it just sort of happened. And I took it into my classroom the next week and the reaction was um, really unsettling. I had students like offering me money <laughs> for my cards and you know, students were like, I need this game. And I was like, well, okay. <laughs> and um, just right away we saw um, my students, I teach adult ed, they wanted this game. They wanted to play with their families, their grandkids, their cousins and um, it really just took off from there. And so I went from making it on the color copy on the office, you know, at my school on the sly <laughs> to showing it to Karen. And we made up um, the first version of it in Santa Fe. And um, it's changed a little bit since then. My first version didn't have the images in it yet. And then we gave it to Karen's dad, who's colorblind. <laughs> and we realized, you know, that we needed to add the images. And Karen and I have tweaked the words in the last however many years, and we've sort of updated which words go with which words, but it hasn't changed that much. It still is pretty much the original game. And we did, I started with um, one of the word lists, you know, like top 200 words, and I worked from there. And then again, we sort of went through and um, sort of cultivated it a little bit better for more uh, spelling variety, but, um, it hasn't changed too much. And so I don't know how many years ago, four years ago, Blue Canoe came along and mm -hmm. said, I like your game, let's make an app. And I think you know the rest of the story from there. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, that's about it. I'm going to share a couple of, of pictures as I ask folks to uh, who are in the room to share any stories they have of um, early experiences with Color It Out. And uh, I'll just start by saying we, I'm sort of just sharing straight from my own little photo collection, but this is one of the earliest uh, sort of memories I had when it came to people deciding, meaning the students and the teachers deciding how they wanted to play this game. And that's why we know we've got more than five ways to play. Um, this, tell us a little bit about this shot, Laura, because this is a yeah. good one of yours, Christine. So yeah, Chris, Chrissy Lauer in the middle there, um, she's a colleague of mine and she went to Indonesia for the summer and took Colored Out, um, one of the earliest versions of it. And she did a lot of her teaching with color vowel. And this group, you see that they're all wearing orange. Um, what day was that? Would it be? I think that was Wednesday and they oh, were. Yeah. They were red, that's right. Um, she had, uh, you know, on Red Pepper Wednesday, everyone would wear, wear red. And you know they did all these different themes and everything, but apparently this game sort of took over their lessons. They would finish their lessons and gather around and start playing. And this was the first time, she sent us this picture, it was the first time that Karen and I had seen this. The students um, played like you know we originally planned on it, like Uno, and then they started playing in that snake formation. So it's sort of like dominoes. And so instead of covering up the word and the turn underneath, they would you know, spread it um, stacked like dominoes, snake style. There we go, that's good. 
Um, and so they could see all of the words behind it in the last turn and they would just extend their turns in practice more and more, which I just think was beautiful because we didn't even realize um, that we could do that. And so the play here, if just to put a fine point on it, is it looks to, if you look at the stack of, of um, cards, the snake of cards, a little bigger for everybody, um, at any given moment you see right now only one word, but the word under it was the source of play, right? So if I, you know, look here, right here, there's blue moon new, the card under it, let's imagine it was student as they lay the cards. And so they played blue moon student, blue moon new. What's so special about that, Laura? What, you mean about the continuation there? That turn, you're right. And I'm gonna ask Robin this as well, but what's, what, was, what did we find compelling about this game as far as how does it actually help a learner? So when a student, um, when you take the first turn, um, the setup from the image and the color border from left to right is priming the student to say that word correctly, right? So if they have blue moon student and they put down the next card and it says blue moon, and it's got computer with a U underline, they've heard that sound five times. And so they're able to apply that sound to the underlined um, vowel in the sixth word, basically. And so when they're playing that way, stacked like that, it just reinforces that flooding. Um, another way that some people have done it, instead of like snake-like design, they've done branching out like dominoes. And so what we've seen, I know Karen has some footage of this too, we've um, sort of a more flexible version of that is domino style. And you'll see them taking several turns. They'll say blue moon student, blue moon computer, blue moon newspaper, blue moon, you know, and it keeps going and going. And so what's happening when they're playing is there these little mini floods. In the regular game, it happens six times, right? Blue moon student, blue moon computer. But anytime they do, this is domino style or the snake style, it's really compounding that flood. And so it's even more powerful. And the amazing thing is that students do this on their own, which leads to more practice, right? <laughs> we don't have to say, we want you to do it this way because it'll help you practice more. They just, they naturally want to do this, which is kind of amazing. And these adorable kids were playing <laughs> dominant. <style. laughs> um, I do, yeah, I wanna come to that point for a moment is just that idea of, of some material that is so engaging that uh, not just a child, but any adult as well, just wants to spend time with it. Um, in the early years, this was a picture of my kids that you just saw, but they were at a Montessori school at the time. And I had studied what Montessori was all about quite a bit before that. And one idea from Montessori that has always stuck with me is the idea of materials that themselves are inherently compelling because they contain a, a design that makes you want to spend time with it. Has anybody spent time, anybody know about the pink tower? Raise your hand if you know about the pink tower. Okay, so the pink tower in Montessori method is uh, 10 cubes and they are all uh, that old kind of pink color from the doctor's office. Anybody remember that pink color? Yeah, kind of, kind of not the most attractive, but it's called the pink tower for a reason. So these, these blocks, um, all you can do, you're shown by an older child, if you're a four-year-old, let's say, um, you stack them and you stack them all. And the goal is to stack them all. And there's inherent self-correction in these blocks. Meaning if you put a heavier block, it's going to become unstable and fall on top of a smaller block, right? Um, and so in the Montessori philosophy, the child will spend who knows how much time it's it's undetermined because each child's different but they will do this activity over and over until their soul is fulfilled and i just love that concept uh with color it out i think that's part of what happens in it and that's why these women in indonesia pretty much just took over like we we've got this we know what we want to do with these cards <laughs> we'll lay them out this way because we want to um, and then we've seen that happen with players after players after players that that even in the same room of teachers being trained, uh, people will break out in different ways. And the more we take our hands out of that and direct it less, the better, I find. I have um, something to say about that. In fact, about that? Um, yeah. uh, if you look at task-based uh, language learning, um, when the students are arguing about how to play and what the rules are going to be, and it takes a long time, 
before they even get to the game. That's actually part of the task because they're they're talking. I mean, they're talking to each other and and they have uh, it, it's it's pur purposeful uh, discussion and talking about oh it's my turn no it's your turn oh uh, you have to skip a turn and explaining how the game works. If I if I uh, if I don't say anything at all, it's much better for them in their uh, language learning process. Other stories from folks who have seen students sort of take on their own way of playing or touching these cards? Well, not in, not in cards, but just like choices. So task-based, I kind of naturally go to that. And I've even done that in workshops, like Color Val workshops in Peru, it's like just, I just kind of listen a lot more than I don't give instructions. I'm just like, okay, where can we go with this now? And I leave it up to them because usually if they're really excited by something, you know, <laughs> that'll be much more interesting and much more productive. So. And they're using the language. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, let's take a look. I wanted to, to share an early video of what we, you know, were witnessing. And this was in sort of a more strict version of play or the intended original version, which I think we haven't mentioned yet, but um, Laura, you based it on, on the game Uno, right? Yes. That was the, that's the sleeve. Right, that sounds good. <laughs> and so in Uno, you match either a number or a color. Um, and it, it's, it wasn't really so much about the matching. Um, I think it's just, it's good game metrics because you have choice, but not too many choices. Mm -hmm. I think some games when they have so many different parts the amount of time that you spend actually learning the game, even though you're practicing language, sometimes it can be kind of complicated. So I liked this sleeve because it narrowed down that you have choice, but you really only have, you know, in Uno, it's two choices. And so um, the two variables are just the, the colors essentially. And so um, if you play, if you don't know how to play, you know, you put a card, you try and match one of the cards. So right here, this is grade A pay or wooden hook push. And you have to put down a grade A word or a wooden hook. So you really have two choices okay. um, rather than you know just play any card you want. And for whatever reason, that metric of having two choices out of the um, 15 color vowel choices seems to keep play moving enough. And then we also have wild cards. So if you don't have one of those, um, you draw a card from the deck up to three cards or you can play a wild card or a skip or something like that. So it seems we've kind of tweaked it but it seems to um, work to keep the play going, which is important for a game. You don't wanna spend a lot of time like getting cards into hand. You know what I mean? You don't wanna, you don't wanna spend too much time on setup. You wanna just deal the cards and start playing. And we found that this seems to work pretty well to get the play going and it continues. So out of our five, this is going to be number one. And number one really should be the original form of play that we've, um, included in the instructions for the game. So let's take a look at what that looks like. This was a, a day when we introduced the game. So players were new to it. And I like this piece uh, because, it, and this will be my voice you hear, but we're doing learner training. And if, if you've not heard that phrase before, I want you to hold on to it. Um, learner training is permission for you to tell learners and show them and love them into doing something the way you want them to do because you know how this works, right? Um, and I just say that because I've found classrooms where teachers uh, don't want to be too pushy or they don't, you know, working with adults in particular. So watch the gameplay and how I, you know, I, I'm guiding the student, but listen to the spoken turn. You're going to hear him um, do this, this pattern of play that exists in this game and the ones that follow that we'll be talking about today and showing. So here we go. A gray, 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 Gray day, April. There's six April. words. Three April. words, three words. Oh, okay. This card, that so, card. Okay. Try it one more time. Oh, oh no, okay. try again. Okay, he says, <laughs> no, try again. Oh, okay. Gray day, gray. 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 Gray day, April. Very nice. April. That's it. April. 
So what do we see here? What's going on? Just a couple of things that he's gaining awareness of doing. What'd you notice there? Yeah, uh, he, he is getting it that the uh, vowel sounds have to match and he didn't yeah. get that before. Right. And now suddenly something clicked and he's got it. Right, so first I think in the earlier turn, he starts off it's with opriel. Um, yeah. sigh. Sigh or pi. 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 Okay. So there's pronunciation going on. There's just the the technical or or the, the logistical thing that we want to have both cards played in the verbal turn, right? So they can't just say great. He's going to or April in the case. He's having to do that. And there's a third thing in there. A okay. Great, say great. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yes. Um, gray day April. 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 There's six April. words. Three April. words. Three words. Okay. This card. That so, card. Okay. Try it one more time. Oh, oh no. Oh, try again now. Okay. Otra vez. Gray day gray. Great. Great. Great day. April. Very nice. That's it. Okay, so he's now basically equipped to play this game. He still has a lot waiting for discovery, right? Okay. Any final comments on what you see here? Just well, even the the order of of what to do is also a really important thing to learn as far as the basic structure of the game. Mm -hmm. and, and knowing that, oh, maybe I didn't get it right the first time, but I can do it again. Right, right, yeah. So the thing that I, you know, I think, I hope that he discovered as he moved on is more of the, the, um, the time on vowel. Mm -hmm. So the gray de gret, you know, that, that he wasn't holding it long enough, but, um, I, you know, by April, it sounded a little bit better. Yeah. You know? Well, and and if it doesn't happen here, remember, what is the teacher going to be able to do? Well, now that people are set up and able to play. Encourage them to use their hand as they're doing it. Yeah. They're also able to just assess by walking around. Mm -hmm. And then I can come back later and we can get back into gray, you know, and trace it. And, and so it's not, it doesn't have to be fixed today. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. it's getting the gameplay down is essential. And then vowel improvement can move over time. Right. There's, there's right. knowing that this is a gray word versus doing that this is a gray word. I like that you're incorporating the physical motion at the same time as part of the game. You're, you can't just put the card down and say, uh, gray day pay, gray day great. You have, to, you have to touch something on each, each stress syllable or you have to uh, do the hand or, or something so that each of the uh, each of the target vowels um, is going to uh, have some kind of motion attached to it, and that's, right. uh, that's I think um, important to make it multimodal. Yeah, I wanted to mention a, a little piece that Laura and I were really ex have been excited about since the beginning, um, and that is that on the card here, there's a there's there are touch points that you need to know about in order to use. And actually what I'll do is the black is against the black there. I'm just gonna use this one since you can see it better. But if you notice, there's left to right scanning that starts in the corner or say on the left. So it's red, pepper, friend. And you can either uh, acknowledge those with the hand on each of those beats. So it's red, pepper, friend, and then say, red pepper, many. I've also seen though, uh, lower level students, they, they have their hands so much on the deck and holding cards that they touch them with their finger. Red pepper, friend, red pepper, many. And I've just mixed two decks, I just realized. Um, I have old deck and new deck. I've got red dress and red pepper. That's okay with me. Um, but thirdly, what's neat about this is they can take their finger almost like a rubber stamp. So what sound is this symbol? This is the eh sound, right? And this is the 
eh sound. And so if the letter is bothering them or distracting them, they can actually put their finger right over it and stamp it with that sound. Now you've got many, if that makes sense. So for those of you that work with lower literacy or lower level adults in particular, this is, I've, I've seen this be very effective. I, yeah, I was, I was about to ask you if you'd um, see them stamp it with an eh sound because that's kind of what I'm doing in, in my classes. I cover over the, um, the vowel in mm -hmm. some way so that they can see the consonants on both sides, but they aren't distracted by the, the spelling of the vowel. Yeah, if the finger's too big, you can cover it up with a pencil like that. So it's just enough to get them to question the alphabetic assumption that the letter is a sound. It doesn't have okay. to happen on, you know, for a long time. It's just early in gameplay that they're saying, oh, this is not Manny, but you don't know when they're going to have that epiphany. It might take several rounds or turns because just doing it doesn't mean they got it. So covering it up is-, is I, I only do it with the ones that they're having trouble with, but I'm also having them um, tap out the, you know, uh, Suzanne knows what I'm talking about, it, the Orton Gillingham tapping the fingers for each sound uh, mm -hmm. method. Um, and then when they get to the vowel sound, then that's the one that they're, uh, that they're gonna substitute the, um, you know, red pepper sound instead of, what I E or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I I would just wanted to say I also just going back to what you're talking about before. This, there's the internal logic, you know, like even like some really bad horror movies or something. They have an internal logic where you just go with it. And when you start this from the beginning, there's a there's a logic and a meaning to it, internal meaning to it, and they they pick that up. And you can pick that up at a very young age everybody has that inside them this is this doesn't make sense so you know i mean <laughs> this is totally bonkers <laughs> but if you have that game you have you have a plot line basically mm -hmm. to go through and that that really makes it work yeah wonderful yeah. well I, I do have to um sort of police everybody to make sure they are moving something on yeah. otherwise they will just do it uh silently and, I, and yeah. if you play the game silently that's sort of misses the point yeah once you get it though once you model it and show this is what's happening this is how we play this game then they're like oh okay you know i mean it's like you know if you went out and you played a game and everybody hopped on one leg well that's how you play that game <laughs> right you know i mean you have to hop otherwise you you don't get any points you don't win right, <laughs> right. i mean who, who would play hockey on ice skates if if you could if you didn't have to, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Laura, how long would you estimate this traditional type of gameplay lasts when we play the um, traditional hand? Under 10 minutes. You know, if you have a full deck and you've got three or four people, but I don't really know because back in the day when we would meet in person, um, You'd, I'd hear, you know, big whoops and cheers from a table when, when somebody won, um, but it wasn't like they would finish and be done and I'd know, wow, that was five minutes because they would always start another game. <laughs> you know, so I, if it was the last 15 minutes of class, um, I'd say, okay, we're gonna play until class, you know, gets out, but I don't actually really know because people always would just start and I'd come over and say, haven't you finished yet? And they're like, yeah, we finished five games already. <laughs> because I just wanted to keep playing. So I don't really know. Yeah, so at the end of class, you'll find yourself having to say, and, and this is the way out of it, um, class is over, whoever has the least number of cards yes. left wins. Yeah. So that's a two minute yeah. warning. Say in two minutes, it's over, count your cards and then they play really fast. Um, I wanted to, before we move into any other versions is to share a, a nice, a very elegant hack that Lynn Swanda, one of our color bell teachers, uh, developed recently. And that is what do you do when we, you know, aren't playing face to face? And well, one way is, and I'll, I'll start with my way and then we'll share Lynn's, is we've played and Laura and Robin and I have all played like this where we hold up our cards. So I know Laura, uh, uh, Robin has her deck with her and Laura does. So you can play a version where we're holding our cards. And if I'm the go, you're starting to wonder, well, where's the discard deck? We all have our hands, but there's no virtual discard deck. So let me stop share for a second. 
um, and see if we can do it this way. Um, so you can hold up your cards if your students have them. And remember, we, we already know from the very beginning that students love having this game, unlike any other language game, like how many English learners buy Boggle or Scrabble or any of those? Pretty much zero. You know, it's not, they don't consider it a game for themselves, but this it, is a game. it's too hard. Right, yeah. too hard. Why would you do that? But this is a game that we know adult learners want to take home to their kids. Um, so they, they may very well have it. And then we have some schools who actually have bought colored out for family literacy night and send it home with the families. So that's pretty powerful. Um, so I'll, gonna, I'll play and let's all imagine, you know, we all have decks. And if you happen to have your cards with you in the room here, go ahead and hold up, you know, seven cards. We'll see if we can play a couple of rounds. Well, a couple of turns. So I'll start. And I'll say black cat, fantastic. And now I'm the discard and I hold it here. Um, so now it's Robin's turn. Okay. Um, cup of mustard Sunday. Cup of mustard cover. Now you hold it up and keep it there. Okay, Laura, it's your turn. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. Cup of mustard cover. Cup of mustard cousin. Now Laura keeps hers up. Who's going next? Maybe it's me. <laughs> oh, there we go, Suzanne. Oh, and then Jennifer. Can I do her purple or just her yeah. mustard? Either one. Um, oh, purple shirt nurse, purple shirt herd. Good, now hold yours up closer to the camera because you're now the discard, even closer. Okay, I'm sorry, I hid my view. Let Even me closer, no, <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Good, we can now see that you have a rose boat word and a purple shirt word. Great, Jennifer? Um, yeah. Rose, rose boat though, rose boat toe. Great, okay, and now, now. Am I backwards? Is everybody seeing me backwards? Nope, you're okay. perfect. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and the rose bold toe and oh can you see that <laughs> you're being a, yeah. by the color vowel yeah. chart <laughs> yeah so and the, oh sorry and uh here and the virtual the, backgrounds come to bite us yeah <laughs> no okay yeah rose bold bold great now i'm going to be a proxy for someone who doesn't have some cards where I'm going to put a card in play and someone else can take the turn and then it'll be Susan's turn. So um, for example, I have, what do you have? You have gray. What do I have here? Uh, there we go. Okay, so here's the play. Now we both have the cards and who, these are gonna be gray. So now you can turn yours now upside down the other way so they can see. And let's just say that it's uh, Joe, let's see, who doesn't have a deck? Marianne, you don't have a deck, right? Okay, so Marianne's going to take the proxy turn. So here we go. I'm supporting her to take a turn. Uh, oh, okay. So I go gray, okay, day, no, gray day, same, and gray day, raining. Great, nice. Yeah. And I'm the discard, and now it's uh, whose turn? Suzanne's? So, no, Susan. Or Joan. Okay. So we've got gray day raining, gray day take. Okay. And near the discard. And last turn is from Joan. <laughs> gray day take, gray day great. All right. That's kind of neat, right? That was okay. All right, and then the other way that I'll show briefly, and we do have a video of this for those who are in the Color Val community, is um, Lynn Swanda set it up this way. She put four cards, actually I think it was like this. It was five across and five on the bottom. And she simply said, this is the discard pile. And in this way, the students, nobody has to have a deck. Um, so you can all put your decks down and imagine you don't have this. And what we can do now is I say, well, this is where we're going to put all the cards. I'll do the first turn. 
a cup of mustard mother, a cup of mustard oven. And I put oven right on top and I put a new card here. Okay. Uh, so the next person to go is, and I'll, um, who would like to go? Maybe um, Jennifer wants to go. So Jennifer, you need to play off of this card, either a cup of mustard or wooden hook. Uh, Out of here. Wooden hook, cook, wooden hook, good. Great. Not just good, but great. Okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> and now it is um, Helen's turn. And she Ooh. has to play off of this card. Thank you. Green tea people, green tea eat. Fantastic. You Don't see eat people? Nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. Lovely. So this is pretty elegant. I, I like it a lot. Um, and I like seeing, I haven't gotten to spend a lot of time with this deck recently, but you'll notice that in the new, uh, the new edition, we have the skip uh, features and all of the special game features integrated into the cards. If you have an older deck, you know this is an innovation. It, it, it's been nice for gameplay, okay? Mm -hmm. So neat stuff. All right, well, the, the length of a game is, as Laura said, you know, 10-ish minutes, maybe 15, depends on, you know, it's random because of the way cards are. Um, but, well, and the other thing is that it's win and lose, right? So when we play a game with our hands like this, we're trying to run out of cards and if we are the last one to run out of cards, we lose and the first one wins, right? Um, in some adult ed classrooms that I've been in, uh, they've opted pretty quickly and it's almost by design. Like if they're lower level, they're not necessarily that interested in beating each other. They kind of want to support each other. And so we've found that then when they break out into dominoes, that is a faster game, it's more cooperative and there are no losers really because you can play pretty, pretty much from anywhere in the domino layout, okay? Um, Do you find people taking turns or playing simultaneously? Because sometimes I have trouble getting people to take turns. Um, uh, I've seen it right. where they take turns um, uh -huh. and they find multiple floods. So one example would be over here. I have a nice photo of it in. Oh, my color belt. Can I just say about that? I, I, um, I find that turn taking is really important because otherwise I find that the, um, the stronger students will kind of take over the game and the, the more reticent ones will hang back and, and let them do it. And so I, I, I kind of get pretty adamant about turn taking. Nice. Yeah, I, I also like I've, I've done not this, but I just did the today I tried like Jamboard, just a whole bunch of Jamboard sessions and breakout rooms. And, uh, you, you know, I did that because I wanted just two in, a, in the breakout room because they're middle schoolers and, uh, you know, one person will do all the work. So mm -hmm. I was trying to make it more equitable. <laughs> well, looking here, this is my friend Erin, and you can see that she's playing a domino self-play version. This is just her playing on a Saturday morning. And so she laid out each card and she took a turn each time. And we got to this point, it was, uh, it was neat with these three card layouts. If you can see this part right here, I can make it a bit bigger, I think. No, not so much. So she, she got to piece, she laid out three. And then later on, she had a turn that sounded like this. What, what would it be? Green tea, piece green tea three, green tea read, right? So a nice triple, but that was pretty neat. Mm -hmm. um, but it can definitely be done by yourself as well. Um, I'll just jump in and say that um, I think I've been surprised by which of my students are competitive and which ones aren't. <laughs> and um, I think a lot of my adult learners really love to play a slightly competitive game. And the nice thing about Uno and Color It Out is you can win without being the um, best English student. You know, it really is about if you have the cards that match. And so it's not that the strong students win all the time. You know, some students who are usually very quiet and might be, you know, um, hesitant and stuff, they can win. And it's wonderful to see some students who you don't think are competitive or very, you know, 
um, outspoken, have them cheering and winning and seeing that it's actually quite equal, which I like, you know. Yeah, good. So now let's go back to, if you remember the, the head to toe that we saw in Indonesia. At about the same time that that was going on in Indonesia, I got an email from one of our color valis, uh, who's up in Colorado. And she, she, I think she wrote this. Uh, she wrote in and she said, hey, I love this game. I need to order another game because I cut my first one up. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean you cut it up? That's not how it's meant to be used. Um, you, you know, I, I was sort of mystified for a moment. And, but then I looked at what she sent me as an attachment and what she had done. And again, this is uh, working, in her case, she was working with low literacy and she was tutoring a single student. Um, she'd cut them up like this. And I thought, oh my gosh. And this is an early version uh, one of the prototypes. So it was square corners and really lent itself to this. You can do this with your own deck too. Um, but what she was able to do with this is she was able to, if I just put these off to the side, um, she was able to take, for example, all of the purple words, right? And lay these out. And I think there are some missing from this particular collection, um, but there are several there. And then she, her learner was able to sort these purple words by the part that's underlined, the spelling pattern. And it's already marked up. So they don't even need to decide what they're trying to compare, right? So now let's just, let's do this. I'm going to call out, say names from the room and you're going to be that student as I move it for you. And I think I can see well, most people, let me go down here for a sec. So Damaris, we haven't heard your voice yet. So you're the student and uh, this is your finger. <laughs> and as I move it, you're going to say the word uh, purple, right? Starting with purple. Purple, purple shirt, bird. Great. And um, let's see, uh, Joan is the next student, is the same student, but she's the next voice. Uh, purple shirt, word. I put it here because it's not the same letters as in bird, good. And now Robin is the student. I want you to put purple shirt birthday under purple shirt bird. There you go, great. And now I've got this card and my student is now. A purple shirt, birthday purple shirt. Okay, mm, next word, purple shirt heard. Is it a new column? Yeah. Okay, there we go. Um, here's the next one and let's have uh, Suzanne. Purple shirt heard, purple shirt nurse, and it's a new column. Oh, okay, good. See, I, you're doing fun things that I didn't even anticipate. You're keeping the spoken turn. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm. How about this word? What do I do with it? Uh, Marianne. Purple shirt nurse, purple shirt first under birthday. Okay. It's spelling, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. We didn't even talk about it, but it is. It's, it's getting into spelling. And here's my last word for the moment. And that would be, what would that sound like, Skip? Uh, purple shirt work in a new category, new column, yay. Okay, good. <laughs> and um, I, you never know what I've done with all my other little cutouts. It's so funny. There's several more purple word. words. Yeah. Yeah. Word. Purple shirt word. Purple shirt uh, word. Aha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. Okay. So what you can do when you have them all cut up is you can simply put out, you know, a set of the blue ones one day. And I've done this at workshops and teachers just want to walk through these. I say, oh, sort them by spelling pattern. And whether you do them this way that you see here with purple, or you might then just easily organize them this way. Now we have a bar graph. Mm -hmm. right. You know, so bar graphs are very powerful. Any other thoughts, you know, spinoffs of what we're doing right here? Karen, we haven't done this before, I don't think, but couldn't you um, have students search for all the underlying O's in, throughout all the colors and then, you know, do the reverse? Yeah, yeah, we could do the reverse. I mean, it would take a little bit more time, exactly, cover over, but pull out all the O's and say, you know, how do you, how, what sound does O make? and give each group um, a section of cards and they quickly pull out all the O's and then you could really see how many different colors O can make. Right, so. I mean, o is obviously a very rich spelling um, letter, but um, that might be interesting to do the reverse, which I don't think we've, I don't know if any group has done that. 
Right. Have any of you done that with your students? Uh -uh. Yeah, so that could be really fun. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's working and saying, okay, we're going to look for them when they only have just one O underlined. And you I've not be... done it with the cards. I've done it when we're doing, um, you know, the spelling exploration worksheet. I have them reverse yeah. it and then say, okay, what are the different kinds of things that an O can spell? And then we, we examine what that can be. But that's... Uh, yeah. That's that's for my more advanced students. Yeah. Yeah, so you, but I've just been reminded recently with my students, um, I they still it still blows their mind that an O can make more than one sound, you know. And I think having this the tactileness, you know, seeing it with the color and the image and everything, it really kind of drives home the point that you know here an O can be oo or a cup of mustard or rose, and it might help some of those students really visualize that they are in fact different sounds. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> I'm having fun. <laughs> so, I'm just, yeah. I'm a gigantic mess on my desk. <laughs> so, what I love about this is that the color vowel approach is from the sound to the letter, but this also gets you from the letter to the sound mm -hmm. if, if you want to, you know, go both directions and, it, it and, that connection, yeah. and, the, and the spelling. Uh, yeah, yeah. Also, yeah. In terms of teaching, it's like just the discovery, you know, I mean, don't, you know, put any pressure. The game is is great because it doesn't put any pressure. You're just like, oh wait, here it is. Here, how does this fit in? And how does this fit in? And you just discover along the way. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing that my students have always discovered is lots and lots of mistakes in the game. They'll call me over and they'll hold up a card and say, <laughs> "Oh, teacher, I found a mistake. You know, this whatever. This really isn't purple. It's blue." And you're. <laughs> And you get to say, um, actually it is. <laughs> and they're like, what? <laughs> and they realize that, you know, they've been saying it wrong their whole lives or something like that. But um, that discovery aspect, it does give them a free and safe um, area and space for them to take that risk and say, I think I found a mistake. And then you can actually point out that the mistake is the way they've been saying it. But it it, it doesn't feel, um, you know, punishing somehow. And it actually can be really powerful if they think that word is mother and it should be rose. And then you point out that it's mustard. And for some reason, um, that error correction really sticks. Yeah. And this, this is powerful. something with even like English speakers, right? I mean, you know, I used to say, uh, didn't say primer, I said primer, you know, and my friend was like, it's actually, it's not, you know, it's this, you know, I mean, and you're like, whoa, you know, I mean, so yeah. <laughs> even with English speakers, of course, because the spelling doesn't match, it's often embarrassing. <laughs> I, I, I've had co-teachers insist that what was an olive sock word, what, and I said, well, when you when you say it, it comes out, uh, and they said, no, it's it's what, what it's it's an odd ah. it's no it's, it's so, so yeah. just just arguing with people about the pronunciation is a, a way of talking about the language too that's right yeah. exactly hey, yeah. hey, karen yeah. um just looking at the the cut up ones that you have piled over to the left it would be fun to i mean it, it's pretty obvious they're all o's but i'd like to sort them myself sort of the where the O is the first letter, the O is in the middle and the O is at the end. And then see what different, if they see any patterns to how O is pronounced when it's in those different positions. And they might notice that at the end, it's usually either blue or rose, but it's almost never mustard or something like that. That could be an interesting. Yeah, yeah. Like a more the advanced structure uh, spelling. Go ahead. Say again, Dr. Barr. So in syllable structure, so if you're uh, if you have an open syllable, you're more likely to have the long vowel or the the moving vowel uh, than the uh, than if you have a closed syllable. No, there's all kinds, and then then we start getting into our own questions, which that sort of sounds like our own question to start with. And if you have mm -hmm. some kind of a, a teacher linguistic question, why not? You know, you have we have this resource. Um, it's fabulous. I wanted to come to these two cards just because I have real life stories from one from my husband and one from my brother-in-law. <laughs> and um, the word because this game is truly the moment where my husband discovered in play that this word is not pronounced as because. 
and he'd been he's been speaking English for 20 years you know so this was about five years ago and I you know had my whole family play because I thought I make this game we should play this game so we were playing this game and he held the card as he was playing and he said a cup of mustard because I said yeah and and this is important because notice that we're for lower level students we're helping them succeed the first time right uh, possibly one of the first times, a cup of mustard come, even though it looks like comb. But here was somebody uh, who, you know, was playing because and learned that it's because, and I, he said, why hadn't you ever corrected me before? You know, you're my wife and you're, you know, your language teacher. And I said, well, because I, I know when not to do certain things, you don't correct your sibling, your, your husband about something, but um, about those kinds of things. But I said, oh, well, I thought it was your accent. And I thought it was his accent. And it's, he said, it's not my accent, it's the letters. I just thought that was a really, that struck me that moment where I, despite all my years of experience, I had chalked up his speech to something that was unquestionable, which was accent. And, and then he said, no, if I'd known that this was mustard, I would have, you know, I, I could have changed that years ago. Isn't that? I know it's, to me, it's very profound. <laughs> and then my brother-in-law answered a question. Yes, he does. I said, did you say does? <laughs> he said, what? And I said, you said does. Yes, he does. He said, yes. And then, and then we got into it and, and we introduced the chart to him. So um, as Laura mentioned, you never know what a given student's word is, which word it is that they're going to route out and correct. So that's exciting. A lot of English speakers don't know that you know, says and does are irregular verbs. It doesn't, that, it doesn't occur to them. Right. And uh, the game has Can that. Can I ask it. a question of, of Dr. Um, Bart? Do you say yes. because? Some people do, say, yeah. Um, because or because. Uh, the some people say because because of the cause. So they, they remake the okay. word. Do you say because uh, as if it were cause? I don't know, because <laughs> uh, the, infamous, the infamous problem sound. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, um, you know, we'll just mention briefly, and then I want to talk about advanced play. But in the new deck, and you can tell the new, the new edition has the images that you see in Blue Canoe and that are in our fifth edition. Uh, the older deck looks something like, you know, like any in kind. We have pictorial images. And there's not a great deal of difference, except that red dress changed to red pepper. Um, notice that none of this matters. If you want to mix decks, that's okay. And if you do have decks that are missed, I've, I've had a few people write me and say, how do I unmix them? <laughs> Help me. And I, I was like, good luck. I've tried to unpartner my decks many times and it's just very punishing. Um, in the end, it really doesn't matter. You, you can't break the game by having, you know, even if you end up with this happening, um, a mixed deck, and this happens. Same word twice. That's oh, okay. they love it. Yeah, that's okay. The, the, the students go crazy. They they get real excited when it's an exact match. So it's fine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Double bonus points. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so I, I really don't recommend trying to unmix decks unless you are a glutton for punishment. Um, the other thing I'll mention just about new and old is that in the old deck we had a word like daughter, uh, we, we were very interested, weren't we, Laura, in, in honoring sort of how many people could play this game, whether native or non-native speaker, uh, child, adult. And this particular markup was there as an acknowledgement of the native speaker variation that we have uh, between uh, Olive Sock daughter and Auburn dog daughter. Um, in the new deck, we, because we're interested in consistency, you'll find that words that are Auburn for many native speakers, we've coded as olive. And I just wanted to, you know, let you all know that we've made that as a conscious decision, right? So that it would play well with, with Blue Canoe. Um, and also just because visually, Laura, how do you, can you talk a little bit about what we tried visually here and yeah, I mean, problem? Laying this out, I probably have 10, 15 different versions of the Auburn Olive card combo background on my computer, looking at, you know, dots or stripes or ways to 
graphically represent a choice there. And we went with the stripes just because they looked good upside down and, you know, it was okay. But, you know, even if I'd explain it to my students, my students would say, is the dog wearing a sock? Why is there a sock in a dog? You know, like it just, suddenly it was like an illustration. It wasn't just an icon symboling a sound. It looked like, you know, like a little cartoon was happening there. And so um, it was fine for the first round, you know, because students were doing very well and everything worked. But um, of course, Color It Out came out before Blue Canoe because Blue Canoe was based on Color It Out. And so once Blue Canoe came out and was doing well, in Blue Canoe, we went for the lowest cognitive load for users. So student-based, you know, focusing on what was best for users and for students. And that means not always um, focusing on native speaker teachers. And so because we wanted to align with Blue Canoe, which was the minimal, um, minimal color vowels to be comprehensible, that's why we went with just choosing Olive for the, the next version of Color It Out. Because um, users and learners don't need to, they don't need to know Auburn or learn Auburn to be comprehensible. If they use Olive Sock, they will be understood just fine. And we found streamlining that was effective. And we still have, you know, sometimes native speakers will say, that's not Olive Sock for me, it's Auburn Dog, which is true. But we also come back and say, but if you say it with Olive Sock, you will be understood. And that's how we ended up at that, that point. So in one sort of um, the, the touchstone of all this is maximizing practice, minimizing discussion, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you have there, Suzanne? Okay, so I have Orange Door and Auburn Dog, because this is a really early version. Nice. Wow. Oh, show the backside of that to people, would yeah. you? Yeah. This is that's vintage. <laughs> uh, this was the very first prototype, and we made about a hundred of these total. Uh, not Ooh, this is worth a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> they were very expensive to make. They cracked easily because they're just cardstock. Uh, they're poke. They're pokey. <laughs> they they're, are pokey. They're, they're very pokey, and they don't shuffle well. But they were prototypes. <laughs> That's how we started. So uh, why orange door and auburn dog? Like important. important. You're, you're obviously an orange door person who has a back vowel merger or else you wouldn't need to ask that question. I guess so. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll take you back over here. Um, well, to the chart's a nice answer, right? Uh, uh, I'll, I'll just quickly cover it. For people who have Auburn in their dialect, words like um, say warm are wa warm. So it's an R controlled Auburn, no Robin? Uh, only if you're British, and then the Auburn is a different place. But that's that's why you've often seen um, or uh, spelled phonetically as the A plus the R. But uh, R is not the same as Orange Door for me. It, Rose Coat and Orange Door are the same phoneme. But I'm but wouldn't so surely is the, the one my co-author would be the first to say for her a word like orange for her was Auburn. Um, orange. only if you say orange. Okay, so, so when it's resyllabified. That's how, that's how Shirley says it. But, okay. Yeah. So it's in the same syllable that, like when the R orange. is the beginning of the next syllable. Right. The preceding sound is an all, so it orange, orange. Now it's yeah. all orange. Right? So orange and door don't match. For some people. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. And so this was this was this concession to say, look, it could be orange for some people, orange, uh, or it could be Auburn, R controlled. And then we thought about sticking rows in there and suddenly it's three colors and little polka dots and who knows how to do that. And so in the new version, again, we went with uh, what, in this case, not so much what would help all native speakers connect to this deck as well as non-native speakers. We just decided to go with simplicity. And so we have orange, door warm and if you are the native speaker teacher who doesn't say orange and you say orange or orange um, that's okay because you can just start with orange door and then you rhyme from door into the word mm -hmm. so it's sort of a hop skip and a jump instead is that good enough <laughs> because what we found is that learners are good with this they want it and they've requested it 
Uh, and that's why, why Orange came back into the 20th uh, anniversary chart after taking a little hiatus in the <laughs> mid journey of the chart. So it's been an interesting journey. Um, listen, I know we're low on time. If you have to go, you can, but I wanted to briefly show you what's happening with advanced students in Color It Out. And, um, and if you've done anything like this, you know, chime in. But what, um, first of all, we've designed the cards so that there is a little um, relationship in every card of some kind. So whether it's um, this person um, took my computer, <laughs> um, they served me breakfast, um, his and her is more about, you know, these are related possessives. Um, we've got, I hurt my finger, something like that. So some of these are about word forms or um, gender. Uh, some of them make a little sentence. Uh, my cousin is a nurse. And then we have some that we've paired because, you know, here's opposites, yes and no, or say some and versus many. And then a third class of words that we've put together because they have the same spelling pattern, um, but different sounds. And like so you just had warm and arm. That was a good one. Or yeah, lie and believe is a is cool. Yeah, that's a fun one because we've got you know lie and then don't believe the lie. That's a double. It's both the same spelling, and it has a fun little twist in there meaning wise, right? And so, say and says is another good one that you had with the uh, yeah. uh, right. same word, different pronunciations. Yeah. There we go. So say and right. says. Okay. Um, so with these, you can as you play a game you can say, well, let's, as we play a game, let's go ahead and say a sentence with it. Um, yeah. I can't green tea believe that you told a white tie lie. And now- yeah. mm -hmm. We do that, but we don't actually play it as a game. We, we deal out a card and, and then you have to make a sentence yeah. with your card, that's yeah. all. Good, so it can go so many ways, but in case, uh, is that new for anybody to know that we've designed the cards in this way? Yeah, pretty fun. Um, so then the next card that's played, you know, if we pick a, a white tie word or a green tea word, here we go. So now when we play, the play could be, I can't re green tea believe that we haven't seen each other in all these green tea years. I don't know what kind of student uh, you have. So how, what kind of sentence will they make? We don't know. But now they have a scaffold and an idea, right? Um, the last, <laughs> this one was brought to us by Megan Calvert, who's one of our trainers. She was um, training teachers and together they developed this way of playing. Uh, they formed a story. So I haven't seen him in orange door 40, green tea years. Next person plays this card next to it and adds to the story. So what's the next sentence in the story? Volunteer, please. My sentence, I haven't green tea seen him, uh, sorry, uh, in orange door 40 years, something like that. <laughs> green tea said, he said it had been I one year, but don't believe his lie. <laughs> okay. I can't, I can't believe it. It's a lie. Yeah. And then if they make a mispronunciation, then you could go back and scaffold it. So it could be cleaner than having mm -hmm. to add the phrase every time right? Um, next person plays. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon you end up with a pretty compelling or funny or ridiculous story, right? Um, so next person plays and says, um, I hear that, you know, da, 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 but I heard this other thing about him. And so we end up with, with the story. And these women in the room, it was all women that day, uh, were just laughing because they had created a very funny story together. So quite advanced play, uh, but it's out there too. So give it a try if you're working with your advanced learners. Other ideas as we head toward the close of our Friday night gathering. What's your favorite new idea? I don't wanna cut up my deck, but I would love to have the, the little solo cards, uh, you know, uh, just to, to sort. Well, you buy another deck. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Get out your scissors. It felt, I remember it felt funny cutting up a deck, but I, I feel pretty happy with these guys. I still use them a lot. The new ones are way too nice to, to cut. 
Oh, you can cut them. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I'm always interested to know what was new or uh, intriguing before we finish up, if we could finish up with a few thoughts, just because i um, always curious. Yeah, well, just using the cards without um, the students having them, because none of my students have them, especially my Chinese students. So that what Lynn Swanda came up with, with the board, and they get to choose off the board, that's good. That is good. Yeah, I was about to say the same. So that board and, and, and having my students use it because my and also my students are young and I feel that they would lose the cards immediately <laughs> they'd be gone <laughs> so having it all there under a document camera yeah that would that would work that'd be good when you put the cards out five across and below it five more it, right. it's like playing solitaire it lends itself to a zoom environment where there's only one set with many participants who can give instructions. That's right. Yeah, I I, there's I, a way to do that. Um, I don't know on on uh, you know Google Drawings or something. I can't I can't think how though. You'd have to have pictures of each card. That would be primitive, I'll, I think. Yeah, I'll caution about this. Uh, when you try to do something with images of these, um, the if you're working in say Google Slides there's always one that's a lower layer than the other image and it's hard to play because then it disappears under another image. Um, so that's a little tricky, but, um, but you know, a document camera like this costs uh, $90, $99. This is an Epevo. And I just had it up about four inches on another platform just to get high enough. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I look like I'm, I don't know what I'm trying to show you, but anyway, it's a pretty handy little tool. Okay. Um, worth the investment. And, you know, it's not always perfect, but it's for this, it was perfect. Okay. All right. Somebody, I think on the Facebook community already created it in Google, um, on Google Slides or Chelsea. Chelsea did that. Yeah. And um, she shared it with me. I haven't used it yet because I just th thought it was going to overwhelm my le learners on their tiny little screens. Right, right. Yeah, and when you do that, that's fine. But just uh, when you get to a place where it's getting under the layer, just um, copy, I mean, uh, cut and paste, and then it's up on the top layer. So that's the trick for doing it digitally. Yeah. Uh, and my, mine is like, you know, $15 on Amazon and you put your phone in there. Oh. And uh, if you can connect your phone to your laptop or whatever you're using and then, um, so that, that's where I have a Mac and an iPhone. So it works really, really well. So I have um, a similar setup, except it's fancier. I have a can of beans that I set my phone on. <laughs> Fantastic. So, I have a can of beans. You, oh my gosh. Put a wing on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to show you the classy way it's done. Oh my gosh. Reynolds for the win. That was awesome. <laughs> Um, oh, as, wonderful. Yes. As your business manager, I would be remiss if I didn't remind you to tell people how they can order Color It Out. Why, yes. <laughs> yeah, this is this is why we remain a business is because of Jennifer. That I, <laughs> I just like to talk all day with you. Um, you can get Color It Out in our shop. And I've just put a link into the chat if you would like to um, order a set. We also have classroom sets of four for a lower price, uh, sort of volume discount. So take a look at that if, if you're interested. Um, it's also well paired because I've challenged myself and tried to introduce Color It Out um, with people who have no prior background of color vowel. I do find that having the image cards is handy. Mm -hmm. uh, but that said, in the game, several of the cards are dedicated to gameplay and giving them the key. And I'm just sort of flipping through mine to find them. But um, Laura did a beautiful job of designing, you know, getting them um, so that you can just have the deck and have enough information to play. Okay. Here. There we go. Oh, the instruction mm -hmm. cards. Yeah. 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 Oh, and that's nice. Yeah, the, na the names of the, of the symbols. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's like two in each deck, I think, and um, it, you can just have it, you know, in real play. <laughs> you can have these on the table. Yeah. And that's a quick little, yeah. Yeah. Play. 
and and let your students know that if they really like it and they do want to order it for their families that they too can order from our shop our shop is not just for teachers so um you know give students the link after you've played it in class and um you know if they want to get a set for their kids for christmas or something that would be that would be cool also exchange students when we finally get back to having exchange students we have a little cottage industry of, you know, if you have any friends who like to host exchange students, they love it as a family game, okay? Um, next week, we're going to explore ways to use the ColorVal launch pad. So if you've ever had a launch pad and you wonder if you're using it to its fullest capacity, uh, we will spend some time with it. So join us next week and have a wonderful and safe weekend. We'll see you again soon. Bye, Bye everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Love you. Nice. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Barr. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>